Ah, good morning. I hope you're doing well. Welcome to the Monday Morning Quarterback. It's uh, the 31st day of October, Halloween, a little overcast, a little dreary out there, and a little bit of rain. Hopefully, the kids tonight will be able to get their free candy and stay dry at the same time. But um, I hope you're doing well. Hey, yesterday, uh, we finished up our series that I titled At the End of the Day. And really, you know, you title titling a sermon series or titling a sermon is almost as difficult for me as writing it. I mean, I just never know what to call them. And so my, I look at my board here and my titles are always so um, sometimes not even aligned with the sermon. But uh, anyway, I, I titled it at the end of the day because I thought Peter was basically saying, when it's all said and done, here's what matters. Because he was writing to those believers who were scattered, who were exiles, who were going through persecution. He's saying, you know, when it's all said and done, at the end of the day, here's what's important. And uh, so that's why I titled it that. And I don't know if that uh, makes sense to you or not. It, it, it at times made sense to me, at times it did not. Hey, we're, uh, if you haven't worshiped yet from yesterday, I hope you'll go back and do that and then revisit this video. What we're going to do is work through the passage and I'm going to share with you some of the thoughts that I had as I was preaching and just could not quite flip the switch to uh, change some of the things that, uh, that I was discussing. That's why I love the Monday morning quarterback. We began yesterday by remembering that Jesus had instructed Peter to feed his sheep. And I think it's an important connection to make that Peter denied Jesus three times. We remember that in the rooster crows and Peter kind of slinks off into the night. After Jesus's resurrection, he gave Peter three opportunities to say that he loved Jesus. And I, I, I don't want us to miss that. I think Jesus was directly addressing each of those denials by saying, do you love me? And giving him those three opportunities. He completes that conversation with Peter by saying, feed my sheep. And in my mind, that's what Peter is doing in this letter. And so it really has two sections as I kind of reflected on the sermon yesterday. I thought, really, I could have either done the notion of authority with elders and submitting, or I could have done sort of the general knowledge that was being imparted, the general counsel. Remember, when we read the Bible, this is not a book of advice. This is a book of commands, <laughs> and it's God's word to us. But within the commands, for me, they're just these helpful bits of counsel for living faithfully. And I uh, think that's what Peter did in the second half of the sermon yesterday. But what I want to do is just kind of work through it. In the first four verses of chapter five of 1 Peter, if you'd like to go ahead and stop the video and read those and then join me here in a moment. Let's go ahead and do that. Start it back up. Notice the instruction he says to the elders among you. And what we did yesterday is we expanded that to people with authority in certain areas of life. Parents, managers, supervisors, teachers, elders in church, club presidents, association presidents, whatever that case might be. Most of us in some form or another or in some way or another have some authority. And uh, so I just wanted to expand it. And I think that's a, I think you can make that leap faithfully uh, in this case. Certainly it was helpful for me thinking about the areas where I have some authority. But he says, be a shepherd. And of course, feed my sheep, tend my sheep. That's what Jesus is instruct instructing him to do. We're called to be shepherds to the people among us. Uh, we tend to them, we feed them, we guard them. And what does that mean tangibly? Here's what he says. He goes on, watch over them, not because you must, but because you are willing. And I wanted us to see that Peter was writing out of his failure. Think about it. I mean, who among the disciples had the, the greater swings in faithfulness and in mood than Peter? You know, he was all in at certain times and at certain times he was hanging out in the shadows denying even knowing Jesus. So he says, I want you to be willing. And so for me, as I think about my relationships, being a willing authority means I don't resent the people around me. You know, when they have certain needs, when they have certain issues, when they have certain problems, I'll just, I'll confess that uh, you know, I've been a, a head pastor for my entire ministry. And there have been times when I've had staff members who have constantly come to me with certain issues and certain problems and certain challenges and kind of dumping those on me. And as a, as a head of staff and a leader and a, a coach, trying to coach them, you know, I, I need to pay attention to that. And 
after a while, you can become resentful. It's like, can you just do it, please? And um, this was a good reminder for me, you know, to be willing, to be a willing leader and a willing coach as I deal with the people around me. So that's what he said. Then he goes on. Don't pursue dishonest gain, but be eager to serve. You know, there, you can read certain publications that I do about clergy and church life. And there are people who are very opportunistic when it comes to church. And um, Peter's saying, you can't do that. No dishonest gain, be a servant instead. And then finally says, be an example. Don't lord over them. In other words, you know, in the Presbyterian church, we talk all the time that we believe in the priesthood of all believers, that we all have a ministry. And there is no person in this church who kind of lords over everyone and has the final say and is, is the big shot around here. We try to make, we try to collaborate and make decisions and we all have our roles that we play. Peter saw that there was probably some temptation within leadership to go ahead and lord over folks. And so I, I concluded that section by asking this question. And maybe something, this is something for you to ponder if you've got a journal that you keep. Uh, who benefits from your authority? And that's a, that's a really significant thing to ponder. In the areas where I have authority, who is the beneficiary? Who is blessed by that? Am I blessed because I'm in charge or are the people around me blessed? And that, that's how I really wanted to get at that yesterday. He then moves on in verses five and six to talk about submission. And in particular, those who are younger. So go ahead and if you will, stop the video and read that now. All right, start it back up. I circled the words submit and humility because I think there's a real connection between that. The more that I submit, the more humble I become. Such a, such a key thought in this passage, in this text. And I think that's one of the reasons God asks us to submit. And for me personally and tangibly, when I submit, I learn that there are people who know a lot more than I do. People with a lot greater insight people with much deeper levels of trust, people with greater gifts than I've got and experiences than I've got. And so submission reminds me, hey, you know, you're, you're, you're not the, the be all and end all here. You know, humble yourself. And so he says that, submit yourselves to the elders, clothe yourselves with humility. We made that jump yesterday to Jesus on the night he was betrayed during the Passover feast. What does he do in John 13? Took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist and then washed the feet of his disciples. That is clothing yourself in humility. And so for me, there's also a connection between humility and service because that's what Jesus was teaching at that very point, right? Be a servant. So as you think about ways that you can be humble before God, I see two, two ways. One, submit to other people who are in positions of authority. Don't have to be a know-it-all. God doesn't like that. And two, be a servant. And the more we serve, the more we take the position and posture and have the disposition of a servant. I've been using the word disposition a lot lately, haven't I? I like that word. He goes on and writes, God opposes the proud. And if you weren't here yesterday or you don't remember, we moved into Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. So if you want to, why don't you go ahead and thumb in your Bible to Proverbs chapter 6. Verses 16, through, verses 16 through 19. Here's what the writer says. God detests. Important, you know, he opposes the proud. You can also translate that God hates the proud, despises the proud, detests the proud. I mean, it's strong language. Verse 16. There are 16, six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. And I just wonder if the writer is like, well, wait a minute. Are there six or are there seven? Counts up. No, there are actually seven. But number one, haughty eyes. What is that? That is purely and simply pride. So if you get a chance to read down through that, you'll also see that God does not like it when people lie. Seems to me there are two um, pieces of language in there that deal with lying. So he opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. When you and I humble ourselves, when we submit again, and when we serve, God has a favorable disposition toward us. And uh, to me, that's just a mind blower. And we looked at uh, Ruth and also David in that context. And so you can go back and rewatch that and see how they allowed themselves to be humble. 
they humbled themselves, and God eventually showed them favor. He then moves on to a second section, verses 7 through 10. In verse 7, let's just read it together. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Anxiety can also be translated cares. So we have cares in two different forms here, two different meanings for the word care. There's a difference between a problem and a care. In my mind, a care or anxiety is how you deal with a problem or how I deal with a problem rather than the problem itself. And so he says, the way you deal with your challenges, cast those anxieties on God because he cares for you. And of course, the word he cares for you means he tends to you. What we said yesterday, and I think this is, for me, this was really helpful. The word cast can either mean to roll or to throw. And there's an image in both of those that if we are, if we are rolling something, we are rolling it up to God, it can roll back. And if we are casting it, and often cast is cast upon the water. When you and I cast something on the water, it will come back to us. And I don't think that's too much of a stretch to say that from this we learn that God wants us to continually cast our cares on him. Again, the image of a shepherd tending to the flock, that's not a one-time deal. He doesn't just you know, take care of them for 15 minutes and they're done, and they're good, and he's good. No, it's a constant thing, and I believe that's the way God wants us to cast our anxieties on him, to continually go to him. And so if you've got something in your life, and maybe if you want to pause and maybe make some notes in your journal, if there's something in your life that is a care or an anxiety, God might not let it go away entirely the first time. Because God wants a relationship with you and me. And so over and over again, we go to God. You know, I have a chronic care in my life, a chronic care that I go to God with every single day. Totally out of my control, involves the health of my son. And every single day, I, I just go to him and say, God, you got to take this today. I, 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 I can't live with this anxiety. I think that's what he's saying. So Peter's reminding those folks, you're going to have some cares, you're going to have some anxieties. Take them all to God. And then in verse 8, be alert and of sober mind. Isn't that interesting? And I, I connect those two words because being of sober mind means to be aware, alert, and serious. And so he's saying, you know what? You got to be, you, can't, you got to live your life with a sense of um, preparedness. Be alert and be aware of what's going on around you. Why? He continues on, your enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Prowls and roars. So what is the devil up to right now? We've talked about what God's up to. He's watching you and me and listening to us. What's the devil doing right now? He is prowling around, stalking, think stealth. He is roaring. What does that mean? When a lion roars, you can hear that roar for five miles in certain places, and it paralyzes the prey. And that's what our adversary wants to do to you and me. And so we've got to be aware of that. I think that's exactly what he's saying. But he wants us to be more than aware. What does he want us to do? Verse 9, take a look at it. What does he say to do? You see it. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith. So there is this sense that we do have the power to resist the evil one. And, you know, yesterday was Reformation Sunday. And really, here we, we do our more memorial of folks on Memorial Day weekend, because if you look at All Saints Sunday, All Saints Sunday is in June. And so we kind of connect All Saints Sunday with Memorial Day, and that's how we do our remembrance of folks. But yesterday we sang A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Terry did a beautiful job on the organ. And um, there is that line where Martin Luther writes, the prince of darkness grim, we tremble, but not for him. And so we can resist. He gives us two ways that we resist. Number one, in verse nine, what do you see there? What is going to enable us to resist? Because, do you see that? Stand firm in the faith because you know the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. There is strength in community. So one of the ways that you and I resist the evil one is we put ourselves in Christian community. Are you in community right now with other believers? If not, that makes you more vulnerable. And if I'm not, that makes me more vulnerable. And then he concludes with one more insight, verse 10. And the God of all grace. And we noted yesterday, you know, I sign off every email with grace or grace to you. 
because grace is for me the, the ultimate gifting that God provides. What he has done for me in Jesus Christ is, is something I could never deserve and something I can't even fathom that God would do that for someone so unlovable. And um, so he doesn't say the God of all mercy, peace, love, joy, justice. He says the God of all grace who called you, and we talked about being called to his eternal glory in Christ after you've suffered for a little while, and we all are doing that, will restore you. And what's God going to do? And make you strong, firm, and steadfast. So what is the other source of our power? Number one, to resist the devil, we have community. And number two, the Holy Spirit. God will make you strong and firm and steadfast. And so that's all I got for the Monday morning quarterback. Yesterday in the second service, I kind of lost my mojo a little bit, having some microphone issues, and it was getting gloomy and rainy and feel much better today. Had a good wedding yesterday afternoon uh, as well, though. Hey, thanks to um, Dick Eckert for being a good sport when I was teasing him yesterday. He was driving really fast. And also, I have to say to, about Tracy, it was her mother's car that had the expired tags, but she was still driving it. Hey, you take good care, and I look forward to seeing you Sunday. What do we do? Genesis chapter 6. Ooh, the story of Noah. So if you get a chance to read uh, chapter 6 and 7, they're really just chock full. Hope you'll do it. Anyway, you take good care, and I will see you later. Bye for now.